Susie, Susie, Susie. Hey. Still kind of sounding a little truck drivery. Yeah, I like it though. Even, but I, I do feel you bad do. that you're sick. Yeah, you know, it's like one of those that won't go away. I know. Just like the Brain Candy Podcast, which is now yeah, episode right. three hundred and two, we won't go Woo! away. Forget 302. it. Three hundred and two. Three hundred and two. It's what um, we're gonna do. That's how right. How are you? I rhymed. You I'm had doing your birthday. Well. It was lovely. Do you feel wiser? I do. You know what? I, I, I wouldn't even say wiser. I say, I'll say I feel calmer. Oh, my gosh. How did that I happen? Feel, I feel more at, uh, you know, even like right before my birthday, I was having, like I had a really bad panic attack a couple nights before my birthday, thinking about all the stuff that I have to do in the next yeah, few months. Yeah, it's terrible. And it's, it's not even like, there is a bunch of stuff, but there are these really, really important events to me where, you know, I'm like a keynote speaker in front of these, you know, very important yeah. audience. And I like panicked thinking like, oh my God, what, I don't know what I'm talking about. What, what I, this is too much. And I had to like remind myself, you are the expert in this. This yeah. is your field. This is your jam. You've been doing this for 10 years. You know exactly what you're doing. I had to like be my own, you know, like, I don't know, Tony Hype Robbins, person. I guess. Hype person. Yeah. I kind of like psych myself like, up, but I don't feel like that now. After after my birthday, I don't know what it is. I just feel like this sense of like, you're fine, you you can do it, and things you know just just try to. I feel like when I'm more mindful, that I don't feel overwhelmed by the future as much. Do what you can I do feel right like now in have, this place? Do you suffer from imposter syndrome? Oh, like when you remind me what that is again, because I think the answer is yes, but I need to hear the details. Kind of like where you feel like you don't deserve to be where you are, usually professionally, and you think people are going to find out that you're not deserving Mm. or legitimate. You know, no, I don't as much because I really feel like, like maybe for a second I do, but... I know when I remind myself, I know that I have put in all the work and I don't feel like an imposter. It almost feels like the expectations that I set for myself are so high and I almost doubt myself. I think it's the opposite where I, I, I feel like for a second, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I think I'm going to just forget all the stuff that I know or all of a sudden be a bad presenter. And I have to just say, kind of do one of those like. Yeah, it's like a confidence thing. And then once I kind of, you know, go through my mind of challenging those irrational thoughts, then they kind of go away. But you have to challenge them. Yeah. Because it could be like a a snowball if that starts, kind of what the panic attack was. It just kind of started snowballing. And my own thoughts were like, well, then you have this, and then you have this, and what if you don't have time? And then da-da-da-da. And then, you know, I had to ask Landon. I was like, Landon, can you please give me a reality check right now? I think partners and friends and all that stuff are really great for that. I'll be like, Landon, I need a reality check. And he just kind of puts puts my mind at ease. Aw, that's that's their job, right? That is. He's so good at it. Uh, All right. Let's see. Is anyone mad at us about anything? Let me think. Mm. They're probably still mad that I don't like bangs. Oh, I have a real controversial subject that I feel like people are going to get mad at me for. Oh, okay. Let's hear it. Yes. But I feel like we should talk about this because I think there's something to this. Oh, and I'm all I've ears. been discussing this with um, some friends of mine who have kid daughters who, and they agree with this. Um, I want to talk about Girl Scout cookies. Okay. Yes. 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 So, <laughs> what about them? Well, how do I even open up this? Uh-oh. So I, I just asked, you know, my friend who has th- like two daughters that are in Girl Scouts. I said, what's your feeling on, on this Girl Scout cookie thing? And she's like, I am sick of it. I'm so <laughs> over it. We have to do all the work. And I hate that my daughters are basically becoming like multi-level marketing, you know, pawns. Okay. And how kind of messed up the whole sale of Girl Scout cookies is and why it what's puts your so argument much here? pressure on okay I just feel like 
the idea that we're going to send out these little girls to go door to door to sell in neighborhoods to win prizes that are essentially like the prizes you'd get at Chuck E. Cheese where you have to sell like 2,000 boxes to yeah. get, you know, or whatever. One of them is like two. I, ha- I even have all the list of But of the point of it isn't everything. to get the prize. But that's not what the little girls think. Yeah. It becomes really um, like... I think it, it affects socioeconomic classes differently. Um, it really affects small towns where I was reading this whole article on uh, Thrillist where they had these moms who wouldn't, they wouldn't even say their names because they didn't want to be identified. It was very <laughs> difficult to find articles about Girl Scout cookies. It almost feels like nobody wants to talk about it because nobody wants to like, I don't know, ruffle any feathers or something. But they were saying well, that... okay. In smaller towns where they don't have as many people to sell to, it mm. creates this like turf war that yeah. goes on and it pins these groups against each other. A lot of times they go to school together and it, it sometimes turns these, these friends against each other and then you're competing. The real sad thing is the entire troop has to work together to sell however much boxes of Girl Scout cookies the troop buys. So they, they spend their troop money, they buy all the cookies, they have them, and then they're responsible to sell them. Mm. And if one girl on that in that troop doesn't sell her share for whatever reason, there could be a million reasons, it almost is like, could you imagine what that would do to the group dynamic when they're like, you're the reason we didn't win or you're the reason we didn't sell these? And just... Having kids, I don't know. It just makes me feel kind of weird, and I wanted to hear what your thoughts were. Now, I've never been well, a Girl Scout, but the people I've talked to about this are like, oh, my God. It's the parents who do all the work. and you know. Yeah, I can see why it would be frustrating for the parents, and I understand also that turf war idea. Um, but just sort of a counterpoint, I guess yeah. it depends on where you stand about the Girl Scouts in general because – Technically, the cookie sales are designed to fund the organization. And if you love the Girl Scouts organization and what they do for uh, young women, then you might be more inclined to support the practice. And people really like eating them. So it's not like some of the other fundraisers where you're like, oh, I got to buy this stuff I don't even want. Um, And I I remember when I was a kid, I had to do a lot of fundraisers because we were poor, but um, right. like anytime there would be a school thing, I would have to sell candy bars and I would go door to door and mm-hmm. I hated it, but I do think it teaches, um, the hard work and leadership and confidence, like talking to adults. Um, mm-hmm. so it's not all bad, but if you don't like the Girl Scouts, then I could see why you really wouldn't like the fact that they have to raise money for the organization. Is that your position? Mm. I, you know, it's just a tough one. I just feel like there are so many that the kids go from having to do these fundraisers at school mm-hmm. to selling stuff for fundraiser Girl Scouts. fatigue is a thing. Yes, yeah. that's it. That it's like, why are we having our kids mm-hmm. sell so much yeah, stuff? That. And it just feels like we need to be i don't i don't know it just feels weird and i looked it up and only 84 cents from every box goes to the troop and the rest goes to making the cookies making the cookies or mm, i Maybe don't know the, what else it doesn't have the to break down the national organization in general yeah yeah and, you know, this is, again, this is like just my opinion on this. And, sure. And I, I, I know that people are going to be like, well, it does this for them. And they go to these schools and it teaches all this good stuff. But, yeah. you know, there was there was a story on here about, uh, in that Thrillist article, about how uh, Chris Rock's daughter, uh, yeah, he, she was in a Girl Scout troop. And, you know, she was able to sell a whole bunch and got sure. a, a karaoke machine or something like that. And other people kind of get screwed and they get nothing. So, yeah. you know, because they don't have the ability to sell all that. And there's supposed to be all these rules like adults can't sell to 
Like you're not supposed to sell to people at your work or oh, really? all this stuff, but nobody follows any of those rules. No, well, I'm glad they don't because I will buy them. I love those things. Yeah, and you're not supposed to sell them online or on the internet or you're not supposed to accept money via Venmo. There are all these things that are rules about it that seem like, mm, I don't know. One thing that you can buy on the internet and you should is Warby Parker glasses. Oh, I love mine. Oh my God, they're the best. I love them so much. They are the best best. I'm so excited to be talking about them because I've always wanted them. Same. And I didn't even know that you could, like the way that it's set up is you can order five different pairs of frames and then they send them to you and you can try them on and keep them for five days and pick which ones you like best. And then you send them back and you can buy one or not. And it's just like a great system because you can do everything from home but you still get to try on different ones. How did and it they don't go make when you, you pay for it? While you like, where a lot of places are like, "Oh, we're going to take seventy five dollars from your credit card as you you know try oh. these on." No, they don't yeah, do that. They don't do that. They're like, "Here you go, try them on. If you don't like them, no worries." Well, and I didn't I even have them. to do anything with my prescription. Like they just called the place that my, my eye doctor and got it. It was no problem. And I did the updated one where I did the eye test uh, through their oh, website. That's... No. Yes. Oh, I didn't so even know cool. you would do that. Yes. They check to make sure. So if you have a, uh, you upload your prescription and yeah. then they do an eye test to make sure that it's kind of still matching and it's, you know, pretty basic, but it's really cool. They have you, you know, you put up your phone and you step back 11 feet and it's really like you use your computer and your phone and a bunch of science and, you know, technology. That's and they are cool. like, here, this is your, your prescription is correct. And it's great. Well, and the glasses start at 95 bucks and it's. I think that that is so great that you can get these like ninety five bucks for everything. None yeah. of that like frames lenses BS. Right. It's a really good deal. And if you go to warbyparker dot com slash brain candy, you can do that free a home try on today. And again, the glasses start at ninety five bucks, including prescription lenses. Lenses include anti glare and anti scratch coating. And then for every uh, pair you buy, a pair is distributed to someone in need. I just think that. They have an iTunes app as well, I, iTunes app as well, um, and the site is super easy to navigate and all that. It's just a great system. WarbyParker.com slash brain candy and Sarah and I both got new glasses. We'll have to post some pictures of them. Yes, I'm going to do the before and after of what my old glasses look like on yeah. me <laughs> that I got when I was 17 because it's so funny and what my new glasses look like. And it was real fun. I was at the clinic the other day after I got them and. Uh, one of our supervisors and my professor came in and she was like, she looked at me and she's like, man, you are so lucky. And I was like, why? She's like, you really can look totally different for different clients. She's like, you put on glasses and all of a sudden you're like a, you know, it's true. You have that you like have traditional like that. therapist look, or yeah. I just roll up my sleeves and I'm covered in tattoos and I can like cater to a different crowd. Yeah. You're like Clark Kent. And she's like, those glasses. I'm like, yeah, that's all everybody needs. Just th- uh, that's my recommendation. If you are in the therapy field, get yourself some Warby Parker glasses. It will really take your therapy game up a notch. I have a question for you. Yes. Do you, I know you're a dog person. So do you think that cats are psychopaths? Mm. Oh, kind of. <laughs> I had one once and whole, well, I had a few. I had a whole bunch of cats. When I was little, I went through this phase where I named all of my cats Sam, and they all died. What? Yeah. So, like, we lived in a neighborhood growing up where we backed up to the Santa Monica Mountains, and uh, there were tons of coyotes. And if I had an outdoor cat, they were going to get eaten. And I lost three cats to coyotes, or ran slash disappeared. And then one cat, and they, I, every time I lost one, I would just name the next one Sam. I was like, no, we need another Sam. We need another Sam. Sarah, this and, is, I feel like that is psychopathic. Yeah, kind of. But that is not even the saddest part of the story. So then I get this last <laughs> cat named Sam and uh, at, at our house and, and I get a knock on the door and it's the next door neighbors who have my cat in a box. <gasps> and the cat was dead because their dog, the cat was walking along the fence and their dog Paw, like big, huge, I can't remember what kind of dog it was, but took his hand and like pawed the cat and freaking bent the cat in half. What? Like snapped its spine. Like, 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 I don't even know how the dog did it, but he like took his, Sarah. like, 
Yeah, this dog, this cat was like in a knot, a cat, sh- and they brought it over in the box. I'm like, that was so traumatic. Oh, I just had to this share that story. This is a terrible I've story. I've never shared that. I've never talked about that on here. It was really traumatic for me. So was that's it my really? cat story. Yeah. I feel like I saw my dead cat, and I was like, psychopath why the hell would they this... bring it over here? Well, that's what I'm saying. Your neighbor is also a psychopath. Yes. But back why to cats you... being psychopaths. Yeah, I think they are. <laughs> Well, okay. So what is it about cats that you think it seems to be psychopathic? They seem a little like manipulative and also like n- like everything's on their terms. <laughs> you know? It's like yeah. no, no, no. You'll pet me now or no, no, no. You don't touch me now. Like it yeah. they're always it seems like and then you should be grateful. I don't know why cats like have this look like when they let you pet them, like you should be grateful that I'm over here letting you pet me. Like, yeah. I feel like, oh, you know, not kittens, but these older cats have this attitude and it's just funny. And then I had a cat Catherine. that would go nuts and just like run around the room in circles like a crazy person. Oh my God. I had to shut the door. I was so terrified of this cat when it did that, that I had to like, I, I ran out of the room and like shut the door. Cause I'm like, this cat is nuts. <laughs> what is that? Does anybody know about that? Yeah, they all do that. What is that thing? I don't know what it's from, but it's like, you know, when it's probably related to the hunting thing where oh, they just yeah. like get this burst of energy and just start losing their minds. They lose running around. Their Dogs mind. do that too sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I get it with Sigmund when he's like, hasn't had enough exercise. He'll do that. But like, how the hell do you exercise? Like, I guess you can play with the cat. Maybe I didn't do that enough. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Cat's basic personality is just, you're welcome. Like you were saying about how you're supposed to be honored that they're letting you pet them. Yeah. What's that about? And you know, maybe they, maybe that's, I don't know. Do people who like cats kind of like that? Well, I like cats a lot. feel like they've won them over. You like cats a lot. I feel like yeah. you should. And you know what? I think you should get that hairless cat. That seems like your type of cat. Lincoln saw a picture of a hairless cat and he he thought it was, uh, I forget what animal, like a rat or something. And he, I was like, no, that's a cat. That's what they look like without their fur. And he was so disturbed. <laughs> I mean, it is a weird thing, but there was an article in The Atlantic about um, why people think cats are psychopaths. Yes. And, Tell me everything. Well, it was the kind of making the argument that they're not, that it's like, well, they just don't have as many muscles in their face, so they can't like have um, as expressive emotions as dogs or obviously people. And so mm-hmm. we just interpret their behavior as psychopathic when they're really just being cats. But it was not convincing. Because like, have you ever been around a cat? I'm sure you have. They're like yeah. sitting on the counter and they'll just like, Without breaking eye contact with you, just knock a pen off. Or- oh my gosh, that has totally happened to me. <laughs> Where they like look at you and then push the glass of water off the yeah. table. Yeah. What so, the hell? I mean, okay, if you want to say they're not psychopaths, but like basically they appear to not have a, con- a guilty conscience, whereas yes. dogs for sure feel bad when they fuck up. There's no cat equivalent to the tail between its legs. Exactly. See, that is the right way to put it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. So I like <sighs> cats, but I also think they're psychos. Interesting. You think maybe we, when we like gave them their own place to go to the bathroom, they were like, now I <laughs> rule everything? <laughs> right. I mean, it is very Because dogs, they don't have that. I'm trying to think, like, what are the, dif- what are the differences? What are the- but like, we have to actually pick up dog poop. Yeah. Well, like you sort just of have to pick up cat stare at you. Too. How yeah. come you can't train a dog to go in a litter box? Could you? I bet you could. Maybe not a litter box, but maybe like an assigned spot. Oh, like well, yeah, you could do that. Like those or whatever. Little, oh, my God. I had one of those in apartments. Do not get those. Why? Oh, because that is a mess. Cleaning that up afterwards. We had that in our apartment. I even built one oh, with real grass. With like a drainage oh, system on. and everything. I was very proud of myself. But then you still got to rinse it out. And it's still, you know, I felt really bad for the people who lived in the apartment below us when I would clean that out. <laughs> My God, that's gross. I know. They were never home, so it was fine. Um, there was also an article. This was in the New York Times. And it was 
what made me read it was it was about uh, dog DNA and how the writer had had her dog's um, DNA tested yes. and they found out it wasn't the breed that they thought it was. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it really was talking in the end about how none of us are really what we think we are. And it touched upon, yeah. for example, that book club book for um, February was Inheritance by Danny Shapiro. And it's about how she took one of those genealogy tests and found out her dad wasn't her real dad. Um, yeah. And it was sort of exploring this idea of like what makes someone something. Like does mm-hmm. that mean she's not Jewish? She thought she was Jewish through her dad <gasps> as well as, you know, I, I guess yeah. her mom was too, but like she started to wonder like what does it mean to belong? Mm-hmm. And it, I think it's That's such a, a hard thing. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about. Like, who is your parent? Is it the sperm donor, or is it the person that raised you, or both? Or oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it can feel especially. So where I think it it feels, mm, I don't know what the word is, shocking or jarring or or kind of like throws you off is when you have a fixed idea of what you think you are and mm-hmm. then that gets turned upside down or changes. Yeah, if you think become when attached. Have like a chi- yeah, when you have, mm-hmm. a, you have a child who says, may, say maybe is adopted and that narrative, that story is part of them growing up and and you know they understand that maybe they have different biological parents but you know, these are their parents that love that, whatever it is, um, that that could be not as difficult. But when you find out like all of a sudden, you know, like, who am I? Everything I thought I'm not or something like that. Yeah. It's like all these questions of identity. Yeah. That's a big thing. I mean, Mm -hmm. identity is like everything. Yeah. But Mm. we, for some reason, and it was totally not coordinated. I keep choosing these books for book club that relate to this idea of parenthood and identity and like we had the book about the adoption um yeah the girls who went away yeah and that explored that idea too and how you can be wrecked by having to put up your child for adoption and all this stuff but it must be on my brain because i keep picking these books and then when i saw that even about dogs because we had sort of laughed about the idea of getting dogs tested but i can see why people like it Yeah. And you know, my February book is about the same kind of stuff too, about the woman who could not get pregnant. And so she's part of a, 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 what are they called? Multiple wives, a a polygamy. polygamy, She's a a part of a polygamy, uh, you know, culture and uh, her whole identity switched and changed when she couldn't have kids. And then, you know, a new wife came around. Well, speaking of pregnancy, uh, yeah. we all know getting birth control is a huge hassle. Literally, not anymore though. <laughs> hers, thanks to hers, mm-hmm. it's like so much easier. If you haven't tried it, this system, you don't have to go to the freaking doctor's office, but you can still it's, get birth control. Which why it's wasn't so this fast a thing and easy. earlier? Right. Well, because men don't need it. Right. <laughs> The patriarchy. But that's another story. Um, But the time it takes to go to your gyno's office, all the hassle of, you know, receiving your new pack on time, blah, 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 all that stuff. Hers basically eliminated that. So you go on, Sarah, you took the the test. You like have an online appointment basically um, where you say what you want and then they'll recommend what birth control would be good for you. And think about like how expensive it can be to even just go to the doctors. We keep getting bills for doctors. I'm like, okay, this is God. Right. It's really expensive. And I just don't feel like birth control should be one of those things that depends on how much money you have. Um, so if you want to get convenient, affordable access to birth control, this is such a great option. Um, everybody's different. So for hers offers 10 well-known birth control options and, um, they'll connect you to a doctor online who will help you determine what is best for you. Just order now. Uh, you, our listeners get their first month of birth control for 
uh, from forhers.com for just $5 right now while supplies last and subject to doctor approval. See website for full details. Go to forhers.com slash brain. That's F-O-R-H-E-R-S dot com slash brain. Um, restrictions apply. See website for full details. What a great thing, man. Mm. Yes, like, it sure is. So makes easy. me mad I when I think about super fast. Yeah, like yeah. what you normally and have to just, do to get something. Yeah. Right. So fast. Okay. Any hoodles. Uh, I want to get your, your take on this story. I wonder if you heard about it. Did okay. you hear about the high school teacher who gave the assignment to his students to get Katy Perry's attention? No. Okay, so this, I think he teaches junior high and high school. Uh, he teaches junior high and high school government. And... Uh, Anaheim Discovery Christian School in California. And so every year, I guess since he's been a teacher, he puts this assignment up on the board. He says, any student that can bring Katy Perry to this school and have her talk to me, you get an automatic A plus for my class. A video of her talking and saying my name gets you an automatic B plus. And so this is something I guess he's done for a few years and he thought it was an assignment that could like, you know, make him laugh, kind of connect to the kids. And there's no, you know, it was a long shot. But then one of his students... This guy tweeted out to, uh, you know, Katy Perry, you know, he was like, hey, Internet, like, do your thing. Make this go viral so that I can get an A in my class. And so it, like, took off and everybody started, you know, talking about this. And the teacher got a lot of heat from it. And I wanted to see what your opinion of a teacher making this a challenge for his class was. What was the intention? Just to be silly? Yeah, you know, I, I think that was his, his intention, but then, you know, it says in this article, but then the tone changed. People were confused by the real in, uh, intention of the art assignment and did not find much humor in it. And he said, uh, oh, one person wrote, it might be wise to ditch the idea of a Katie visit and actually learn. And I, this guy was just, you know, trying to have some fun, I guess. But then it kind of made me scratch my head and I was like, mm, this seems kind of weird. What's your opinion Does he just about have, it? Does he just have a fatty crush on Katy Perry? Right. It did seem kind of weird after I, I took a moment to think about it. But, you know, he was like, I'm teaching him a lesson in, in, you know, social media and how, I don't know. I don't know what. I guess you can spin it. But what do I you mean, think? Are you pro I, or are you con? I hate when people get too worked up about stuff or like anti, this. Like if say? it was just meant to be in good fun, then no harm done. Um, yeah. But... I just wonder, like, what the intention could even have been apart from just, like, like there. it just seems like there should be a larger point. Yeah, Like, is it about virality and showing kids, like, the power that you can have through uh, the Internet? That's cool. But if it's just, like, this is Yeah, but I almost feel like he said that afterwards. Like, that wasn't maybe his initial feeling. And then... Afterwards, he said, his quote is, I believe this assignment can show them how powerful social, social media is. And I want them to see and learn that all it takes is something small that can become something huge. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, so maybe. Did, and, did Katy but, Perry make a video or something? No, not that, I, uh, not that I've heard yet. But I'm trying to think, when is this article from? Because it was, it was pretty recent. Uh, it was, I think end of January or something like that. Oh, no, February. End of February. Seems like, I mean, teachers are in a position where they always have to think of something that will yeah. capture their students' attention, too. So I'm very sympathetic to that. The The fact that their job is so hard to begin with and the kids don't want to <sighs> pay attention. So you know that what? helps that, then. Yes. Yeah. And now that I'm thinking about this, I think there was also something in there that said somebody else's comment was like, it's, t- it's teaching kids the wrong lesson, that hmm. there's a shortcut, that if you just take if you just uh you know forget about the learning and instead just make connections with people in power then you can get to the top versus actually putting in the hard work and you know how else you can earn an a plus by studying and working hard and doing that not finding the shortcut so that was like the argument against it i don't agree with that because that's the reality of life is that there are shortcuts for some people (sighs) Snaps for that, Suze, yes. <laughs> and it, it isn't always the long road that gets you where you want to go. And may, that may not be fair, but it is true. Even just the way that um, you look, you know, if you're yes. really attractive, oh, I yeah. mean, that's a shortcut. 
That's so true. But it's not oh. fair, but it is. And then maybe this is like a, you're, use, you, you're utilizing the resources you have. If you happen to be connected on social media, then take advantage, right? It's kind of like Chris Rock's daughter selling Girl Scout cookies. Oh, Suze. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Man, um, I feel like I like... Oh, I don't know. I, I feel like I wasn't able to communicate my, my not outrage, but my no, what? F- feelings behind the Girl Scout cookies like that, you know, I don't know. I, I, I can't even put it into words of, of really like what I think. I don't know. I'm going to have to hear from some moms or from for, some former Girl Scouts and maybe I bet you you know, change my will, mind on this. You know, they'll get what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, good. I wanted to read this paragraph that now I'm not finding, but if I don't find it, I'll give you the essence, Mm -hmm. which is, um, it was an article about Viagra and, you know, where you often hear the complaint about how, you know, a guy has a limp dick and we put in billions of dollars to like try to figure out how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Um, apparently they found out when they were doing the Viagra work Mm -hmm. that if I forget what it cured, but I think it was some sort of medical problem that women have. And instead of continuing with the research, they were like, nah, we'll just make a dick pill. Yeah. And they stopped researching it, even though they were able to tell that like this could save women's lives. Oh. They were just like, nah. What was the, what was it? No, I, I'm trying to find it. I can't find it. It was just some women's health problem that the re, the early research had shown that it would positively affect it. Damn it. Is it like, I'm trying to think there's one that starts with a D that's a, 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 a oh God, what is it called? It's it's essentially like when the muscles in the vagina con- contract so much at the, um, and it's kind of connected to like mental health and and thought, oh, I like found it. your mind as well, where it cause a lot of stuff like this is, and it makes it so penetration is nearly impossible. That's depressing. Yeah, and so they do these these. It also it's very common in in um, religions where sex is there's a lot of shame around sex, or and there's a lot yeah. of pressure around um, you know a woman's role in like you know conceiving and all this stuff, and so there's so much pressure and there's so much anxiety that it creates like you know muscle spasms that don't allow for penetration, and so there's there are therapists who work with. Um, yeah. What are called dilators to help the woman relax and all this stuff. And I can imagine that a medication that would relax those muscles is Let me what read they're it. talking about. It says, when Viagra was tested initially as heart medication, its well-known properties for men were discovered. Hallelujah, said Big Pharma, and research ceased. However, in subsequent tests, the same drug was found to offer total relief for serious period pain over four hours. This didn't impress the male review panel who refused further funding, remarking that cramps were not a public health priority. What?! Oh, so I'm going to disagree so vehemently because I guarantee you that work at work productivity and hours lost from people calling in sick because of that absolutely adds up. Yeah. Fuck off, dudes. Fuck Sorry, off. Linda. <laughs> right? I just read that paragraph. I was like, well, I got to share this with the brainiacs. Holy crap. Well, and since that is something that I suffer from, yeah. I'm extra mad. Yeah, of course. I personally have... Like lost hours at work over this. Well, <clears throat> one way that you can avoid losing hours of work is by having your coffee or your lunch delivered via Postmates. And how great is this offer that we've been telling you guys about? I had Scott Yeager text me and like, he goes, that Postmates deal, it's too good to be true, right? Like there's a catch and there is no catch. No Basically, catch. If you download the Postmates app or, uh, you know, use the your Postmates account, uh, 
they will give our listeners $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days. So you can start your free deliveries. You download the app right now and use code brain candy. That's code brain candy for $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days. When you download the Postmates app, get anything you need, anytime you need it, download Postmates and save with the code brain candy. So basically if you order um, food for dinner or at work, like Sarah's work, they order um, coffee. You just use your app, and Postmates is giving you a hundred bucks, and you can use it anytime, twenty four hours a day, man. every day of the year, everything you want. You can get it within an hour. How great is that? Amazing. We used it the other day for my donuts. Oh, that's right, we did. Dang, that was so good. We were at my house, and I had a migraine, and. For some reason, when I have a migraine, I need sweet stuff. And I was like, I have to have donuts. And uh, they came, and we ate them, and it was great. <laughs> I had three donuts. Uh, me too. So and no I regret judgment here. nothing. Thank you, Postmates. Um, okay, so that paragraph is infuriating. Did you watch <sighs> the Lorena yeah. Bobbitt documentary no. series? No. <gasps> um, Suze, but you know what dude. I did watch? Abducted in plain sight. And? Holy crap. Did you watch the whole that, thing? Yes. I thought you said it was I too was like triggering. In, well, in the, fir- the first time I watched it, I was just dealing with other stuff that day where, you know, I, I couldn't even open that door. Yeah. But coming back in in my older, wiser, you know, now I'm 33 and I can handle it, mine. <laughs> uh, right. You know, because now I'm, I'm, I'm grown. Yeah. Uh it's so intense and the part that was really like just i don't know hit me really hard is that the way so that very last scene when they're in the courthouse like spoiler alert um and she's pressing charges against him and and she's like pointing at him and saying like you're the one who did this and he sort of apologizes but not really Mm -hmm. It was the exact same phrasing, tone, everything that my dad would say to me. Mm. Exactly this. It almost, it gave me like chills because the way he would speak, the way he said it, the the apology that's not really an apology for what he did, but more an apology for how you didn't see it as love. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're sad. Yeah. And I was like, and then there's a pause like of, of like them thinking about how, and I'm like, oh my God. That could have been the exact same phrase that my, my dad said to me that's, on, that's recorded on the real world. Wow. You can almost play. It's the same thing. And, oh, dude. There's so much shit there. Yeah. If you haven't Everybody watched it yet, it's a must-see. <sighs> it's, it's, it's not that the way that it's made is, like, revolutionary. It's just that the story is so insane that... It's hard to believe, but it's so important mm-hmm. to see because it shows how systems are yeah. abused by people like this, predators, yeah. Yeah. who realize that because they're in the church or because they have a certain type of job, then they are more uh, worthy of trust, at least in the eyes of naive people like yeah. this family was. And holy shit, like what he did with the mom and the dad and all that. Oh my God. And I still think the mom has feelings for him. Ooh, right. She seemed like kind of... She was all smiley when she talked about it, saying it was like the best time of her life. Yeah, I think that it really shows how conflicted you can feel about something that to us seems just terrible. But it's it's more complicated than that. And then do you remember in in the movie when... So this guy who's the pedophile, he, he, they say that he goes and he finds a doctor in California to help him deal with all these feelings yeah. that he has for yeah. children. But I'm 100% convinced the doctor he went to is part of a pedophilia ring as well. Really? Because those tapes that he gave him. Yeah. So like he goes to this doctor and the doctor says, oh, you know what you need? You need these tapes. So like, we don't know what he's telling the doctor. We don't know. This doctor ended up losing his license and was uh, mm-hmm. uh, disbarred or just dis- whatever you call it. Not disbarred. Yeah. It's not the bar. But, you know, had his license revoked mm-hmm. um, to practice therapy or medicine or whatever it was. 
and they don't say why. They don't yeah. say what happened to this doctor. And the, the tone of those tapes that he gave him, so this doctor gives him these tapes that are audio tapes of talking about having a little girl laying next to you in bed. Yeah. And I don't know if it's meant to, like, desensitize him, but really it's just making arousing him. And I, I feel like that doctor was in on it, too. Wow. And there needs to be some exploration of that. Like, I was left with so many, like, weird feelings after that. Ooh, God, it was good. And also terrible at the same time. So good recommendation. Yeah, like everyone should see it. Um, yeah. But I also, Ooh. like I said, watched the... Or I'm watching the Larry oh, and yeah, Bobby yeah, yeah. series. Oh my and god! Yes, I totally derailed your train there. Sorry. No, no, no. I wanted to talk about both, but like uh, Jordan Peele produced it. That's yeah. what made me really curious about it because I really like him. And you know, the Lorena Bobbitt story from the '90s was a huge deal, but it was also just a joke. You mm-hmm. know, she Lorena cut off her husband's penis. What kind of a crazy woman would do this? And so it really dove into all those stereotypes about she was a Latina woman and Uh he was this good looking guy and what's wrong with this fiery Latina. Like that's what they were writing in these articles in like major newspapers. Um, And she was saying like, he raped me over and over again. He abused me. Nobody really took that into consideration and it just became this dick joke. And didn't Um, you say that both she... And and him were were uh, interviewed for this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're both in it, and um, the craziest bit is at the end when they show that he still writes her love letters. That's so weird, right? Hmm. And but they also had footage from like talk shows when he would go on back in the day, and yeah, and he would his brothers would talk about like basically. The idea that having your dick cut off was worse than being killed. Like they, this, I, th- it's like toxic masculinity right. in yeah. its purest form. Well, that's like the whole thing. It's like, like, I mean, I feel like that's so Freudian. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, mm. it's a bit slow, but it's good because it I'll have to turns check this story that we all know on its head, which mm-hmm. is what I love about all these, like the Michael Jackson documentary, that even the Ted Bundy tapes, too. they're all taking stories we already know, but they're repackaging yeah. them in a way that people start talking about them again. Even R. Kelly. I mean, yeah, th- that didn't tell us really anything new, but mm-hmm. everything changed after it came out because people saw it in a new light, which is so important. So do you think that these, you know, I always wonder if, if documentaries and these kind of stories are gaining in popularity as well, or if it's just, this is what I'm, as I get older, this is what I'm interested in, in watching. No, no, they are. They're, they are, they're right? becoming more this, popular. That makes me feel really excited that Aww. now, like, you know, I remember being a kid and my mom would make me watch um, Michael Moore documentaries. Yeah. And I used to always be like, oh, I don't want to watch a documentary. Ugh, ugh, why do you have to watch this? You know? And now it's all I want to watch. And I wonder if, like, the, I feel like the, the youth of today would be interested in documentaries. Well, if you think about it, people now have grown up with reality TV. Oh, t- so true. You know, they're used to seeing things that are unscripted or at least pre- presented as real. And so they have the appetite for it. And then I think there, there's an intersection where that preference is met with this true crime explosion. Yes. And um, that's really made it grow, yeah. too. And now that everything, there's, like, footage of everything now, yeah. you know? I yeah. feel like that fire Festival one couldn't have happened if we didn't videotape everything, you know? Well, and some of my favorite documentaries are the ones where... For whatever reason, somebody yeah. was filming it back, like the capturing the Freedmans. They had so many home movies oh, at a time right. when most people really didn't. Mm-hmm. And so you have that, you know, primary document in the form of videotape that's like, oh, you can actually watch it. That changes everything. That changes everything. It does. And that makes such a great film. And it, like there, there was a film about 
Alexandria or um, Acacio Cortez that premiered yes. at Sundance this year. But they started filming that before anyone knew who she was. She was a underdog, never going to win candidate running who happened to win and wow. become this underdog story. So they had the footage, but there was no way they knew that they were going to have that story when they started. So it kind of is a bit of luck, too. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Well, and like, what was the one about the cult in Oregon? Yes. I forget what it was called. Wild Wild Country. Yes. And they found all the archival footage in the library. Wow. See? Again, I love libraries. And narcissists are going to be the kind of people who record everything, like Jim Jones and all that. So it Mm -hmm. happens to be perfect that these people want to duck. I mean, they're 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 their own worst enemies, really. Yeah. Oh, Um, so and and we all benefit. Well, after they, you know. Well, another way we benefit is that we can now buy comfy work clothes from Beta Brand. They have the their dress dress pants, yoga pants. They have dress pant yoga pants Woo! and they are ultra comfy styles, but they're designed to impress and be appropriate at work and look chic and stylish, but you feel like you're kind of wearing your jammies. Mm-hmm. Oh, they have yes. all different cuts and styles and uh, sizes. They have the standard colors and then they do like seasonal and limited edition colors as well. And you can get different lengths. They have functional pockets. I wear them to meetings and anytime I'm, I need to look presentable, but I don't want to be uncomfortable all day. And that's why they're perfect for, for work and why I started wearing Beta Brand dress pant yoga pants. Visit betabrand.com slash brain candy, all lowercase, to get 20% off your pair. Millions of women agree these are the most comfortable pants you'll ever wear to work. That's betabrand.com, B-E-T-A-B-R-A-N-D.com slash brain candy, all lowercase, to get 20% off your dress pant yoga pants, which Sarah so loves every, saying. It's everything I could do to not Google that right now and go you to need the website. Some? Yeah, I do. Yeah. You know, because for work, I feel like I need to be comfortable sometimes. I'm doing a lot of these like, you know, play therapy kind of stuff and you can't be wearing uncomfortable pants when you're sitting on the floor. No. Yeah. You need to just go ahead and get your 20% off. Yes. Um, all right. What about how um, there was this article in, I think the New York Times New York Magazine, mm-hmm. and it was about how America's professional elite are wealthy, successful, and miserable. Did you see this? Mm, no, kind but I believe it. Out. Yeah, and it was this guy that they interviewed makes about one point two million dollars a year. Great job, um, but really hates his life essentially, and. It got a lot of pushback from people who were like, oh, wow, you have all this money. And right. like, why Why are we even talking about this? But I want to know what you think about this phenomenon. Well, I think there was that documentary called Happiness mm-hmm. that was came out a, long, a, a while ago now. Um, and I believe that they break down, uh, kind of talk about this law of diminishing returns yeah. on how much money you make and yeah. event, like how the real thing that's important to all of us is time. Yeah. And if you're sacrificing money, your time to make money, then it will lead to unhappiness. Mm-hmm. But I was watching the show Scandal the other night. Mm-hmm. So good, by the way. I just started that. Holy crap, that's a good show. Um, and there was a, a line from there and I can't remember it verbatim, but it was something along the lines of like, some people are destined to be happy and other people are destined for greatness. Oh, and almost saying like those two couldn't couldn't be the same. Of like, if you needed like you're you're either going to change the world or you're going to be happy. Wow, that is crappy. I don't believe it. Right, you know, and it was. It's a, I a I bet you that's show, but true so. in a lot of ways. It doesn't. It's like not all not all jobs, right. but. And they were like talking about the uh, you know the president and how I think it was the president and how yeah. like. He had to sacrifice his life for the greater good, and it led to unhappiness. And well, that was I read an article about Steve Jobs, and you know, people herald him as this incredible visionary and just obviously very successful, but mo- by most accounts, wasn't very 
good dad, wasn't very present. Right. Um, and he talked about how he acknowledged it and just said, we all have the same 24 hours a day. It's the yeah. great equalizer. Mm-hmm. And there's just not enough time for everything. And so you make choices and if you're super successful, you're probably not going to be the best parent in the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. But this conversation sort of overlapped with this article in the Atlantic, which was arguing that as Americans have become less religious, that they've expected to get far more meaning out of their work life. And this article was arguing that's not realistic and you're always going to be miserable if you expect the same transcendence and meaning to be coming from where you get your paycheck. Dude, right? that's important to think about. Mm-hmm. Like our and expectations. You know, yes. Well, and don't you feel like we've put such value yeah. on work yeah. and not like this is that, uh, what do they call Individualist culture versus collective culture thing. Yeah where this idea of individualism and, you know, you got to be the best and achieve, achieve, achieve. And it's at, you know, the expense of relationships Mm -hmm. and all this. And then that message is just drilled into our heads with the TV shows we watch and all this stuff. I was even watching The Real Housewives last night. And uh, the one of the the women on there was like, if you're going to do it. Like she was talking about a trip to wherever they went, the Bahamas or whatever, and, you know, having a butler service and all this. And she's like, if you're going to do it, do it right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what a freaking privileged thing to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, get out of here that you, that the only way to enjoy a vacation is if you have butler service and you're like on some private Island somewhere. And like, you know, there's a, it just seems like that message that they're sending, if, if you're a viewer and you're living in, you know, some like small town and, and where the, you know, median income is so much lower than Beverly Hills yeah. and, and you watch that, it plants this idea in your head that you can't be happy unless, and no vacation is good unless it looks like this. And so then it made my mind start going to other places where like, if if you have it in your head that if you have to do it, you have to do it like the best and you blow all your money on that trip rather than like investing in the future, yeah. like it's short-term happiness versus long-term security. And I feel like that message is what's been dri- driven home in, in today's culture and so well, backwards. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we really need to ask ourselves collectively, uh, what is success? You know? Yes. If every message is saying success looks like this and it's pretty pictures on Instagram and it's Ugh. money, then what what is being left behind? And that's usually community and neighbors and yeah. you know, peace. Yes. And so I think we all need to ask what what does success look like for me and am I working on the path that will create that or not? It's so strange, you know, and to like kind of connect everything, you know, we spent so much uh, uh, you know, time on this show talking about documentary films yeah. and how it's like expanding our minds and showing us these different ways of being and ways of living. So there's, I feel like there's like two parts of us as people and as like a, a cult, like society here, where on one hand we like are caring about these real human stories and things that are about the human condition. And then on the other hand, we are this consumer culture Mm -hmm. that's like capitalistic and like all about, you know, squashing the the little guy to get to the top. And it's almost like they don't match. And maybe because we are putting so much emphasis on one, we almost have to have the other to kind of create some balance Mm -hmm. in our lives. Like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, it's like that saying, like when they give with one hand and take with the other. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And even, you know, we've seen the wellness industry. I mean, it's an industry of yeah. uh, people who want to be mindful and be caring about the things that truly matter. But it's hard when it's in re- 
wrapped up with um, yeah. consumerism and all of that. But it's just sort of our job as humans to sift through that and yeah. find what works for us. And it's not, I'm not good at it. Like I was telling Sarah the other day, I'm like a Labrador and I will work until I die unless someone yeah. tells me to stop. And so I need to develop strategies where I have better lines between work and downtime and parenting and all that stuff. It's hard. Have I told the the wood chopper story on here yet? Wood shop? The wood chopper story? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Everybody just needs to remember that. How do you sharpen your axe? Yeah. You got to take some time to sharpen your axe. It and really that's made, how you really win. It made sense to me though when I put it together with the decline in religiosity because yeah. I am amongst the people who would consider <sighs> oneself spiritual but not religious. But mm-hmm. what that can mean is that it's such a vague idea of meaning that, mm. you know, ritual, as you talk about, it can be important. It's an important way oh to mark, God, yes. you know, like this is the day of rest or whatever. Sue's, th- my mind is like blown here. This is really deep. It is. That connection. You are so right. We had markers in our day, in our, I Mm -hmm. mean, you can even say that with prayer. Yes. You pray in the morning, you pray in the evening, even if you pray multiple times a day. Before your meal. Yeah. Essentially praying before your meal is like mindful eating. Yes. Dude. Right? We have to start doing those things, taking, that's like the nuance of like, the stories and the, the everything and like religion and what the takeaway is and all those little, like, it's not a literal. Yeah. It's like, why was this put there in the first place? Yes. Yeah. Totally. Totally. What was the intention behind doing this? It's not just like without meaning. Yeah. And if you look for why people, what, what would, you know, and now it's like science is backing those things up. So we need to find the place where all those ideas kind of overlap and like the thread. Well, I like to think about it in terms of, let's think about, you know, the the Christian iconography of the cross. The reason why that's such a powerful thing, apart from the symbol of the death and resurrection that Christians believe in, is that that uh, intersection of the physical cross represents the horizontal plane of this earth with the <gasps> vertical plane of the spiritual world. And if we oh can find a way to create that in our lives, well, that's the secret. I have chills everywhere. <laughs> that is so beautiful. I mean, that's like everything. That's why I, I'm, I don't consider myself a believer in the traditional sense, but I love cross I cross jewelry and stuff and that's part of the oh reason God. is because well, now like, I do too yeah don't just remember we're on this earth but let's make it transcend towards the bigger picture oh man that's cool yeah and that's essentially the goal of meditation yes of c- connecting the physical world with the spiritual one mm-hmm. and you're in that place of of like yeah well, and oh every God, message all day is like, just buy more stuff. You'll be happier. <sighs> Keep working. You'll be happier. Mm, let's let's think about right. that a little bit more. Again, it's that temporary like satisfaction versus long term. Mm-hmm. And you know, I I say this to like I've said this on here. I say it to friends. I say it to clients. What is the thing that you're most proud of? What yeah. is the thing that has brought you the most joy in your whole life? Nobody ever says buying that car. Right, the promotion. That, they never say, I've never had one person I've ever spoken to, worked with, anything who has not said something that was about either their identity or relationships. Yeah. And, and it's that's just, the most important thing to focus on. And for me, it's not even about mastery. It's about just on a daily basis. And you reminded me of this the other day when you were like, stop comparing yourself to this hypothetical future person that you want to yes. be. And compare yourself to where you were yesterday. Can you improve a little bit? And I think that's a really healthy way to look at, excuse Suze, me, look at it. you make my heart just like swell when no, you say that's... that. Because that really is like, it, that, it makes me feel so good that, you know, sometimes I feel like I don't want to come off as preachy, but, you know, I feel like, like I can see that in you. And I see yourself like comparing like, oh, I could be this, I could be that, mm-hmm. could be da-da-da. No, 
just compare yourself to yesterday. Mm-hmm. You know, of people who are like, oh my God, I, you know, I'm trying to eat better and yesterday, like I didn't eat very well. Well, okay, great. You didn't eat well yesterday. So do it better today. Yeah. Fine. It sounds so small, but it's such a good thing to keep in mind. And it's been helpful to me because it's like, we can really get caught up on like the potential of what we would like to be. Mm-hmm. And the there is incongruity between that and what we are. So we always feel like we're not enough. Yeah, but so. you are enough. Everybody is enough. Yeah. So there you go. Mm. Did bet you didn't know we were going to do some self help today? Bet you you didn't. <laughs> oh, that was fun. I feel that inspired, was, and I feel yes. like I need to go like bust out my cross necklace. <laughs> but I have it on a. I have it on a chain that has a. I even know like I I I like went through this period where I just loved like religious iconography and like necklaces and that kind of stuff or like, you know, like, yeah. the, what do you call it? Like symbols. Yeah. So I have a, a like a, a, what are the wheels? Like the Buddhist wheel mm-hmm. and the Jewish star, the star of David and yeah. a cross all on the same necklace. That's so and funny because I, I do liked, too. Oh my God, Suze. I probably got the idea from you. That's so cool. I love that. I hope more people yeah. do that. Yeah. All right. Represent them all. And don't forget to, you know, like leave us a five-star review because whether we like it or not, life on this earth requires validation in that form. And we love it. (laughs) Validate me, validate me, validate me. (laughs) All right. You're off the hook, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by Wave Podcast Network. Check out all of our shows, including the Brain Candy Podcast, I Don't Get It, Coffee Convos, and Let's Talk About It. 